Anyang Haseo. Good morning, Seoul. I'm going to talk about uh, smart contracts and their economic potential and give perhaps a little broader, different view of smart contracts than, than normally is given. Um, so you can think of society as consisting of multiple layers. Rather like a, a house, you can think of as having a foundation, and on that foundation is built structure like structure of wood or steel, and on that structure are built walls and floors, and finally there's paint and windows and other things to go on that. And so you can think of it as layers, um, protocol stacks. You can also think of networking protocols as layers. And so that's the analogy I'm making here to uh, society. At the basic foundation, we start with security. Without security, you can have very little in the way of good law, and without good law, you can have very little in the way of commerce. And so that's all built on the basic foundation of security. So that's where I'm going to start. And without security, there's not much law or commerce. And security can, re should, can and should be really broadly defined to be trust minimized. In other words, vulnerability minimized to any, any party, whether it's a third party, an attacker, an insider, an outsider, um, each party to a smart contract, for example. Um, trust minimization means minimizing the vulnerability of parties to each other and to third parties um, very broadly and in general. And it applies to all features of your product. It's not just I lock the door and uh, that's my security. All, all the features of your product can be more or less secure, more or less trust minimized. And so, Computer science and the progress that has happened in the last century and the first decade of this century um, has given us this huge computational surplus and a great set of protocols and capabilities for um, creating this security in a new and more comprehensive way in cyberspace, in that new continent that the uh, last speaker talked about. Um, and so it's more important to reduce social um, costs and mental transaction costs than it is to reduce machine costs. And that's, in fact, the, the trade-off Bitcoin makes. Um, it has proof of work. It has sends messages all over the world. It keeps um, tens of thousands of copies all over the world, um, all in the pursuit of trust minimization and having the most secure store of value um, and medium wealth transfer ever invented. And so that, that's really why Bitcoin has the 70% market cap that it has, is it's focused on the foundation, it's focused on getting the basics right, and that allows you to be globally seamless. Um, so when uh, a bunch of us in the 90s, we had a lib mailing list called LibTech, um, where we uh, discussed and came up with many of these ideas. Um, we had some ambitious uh, libertarian problems, how to privatize money, and how to non-violently protect property, and enforce is a standard term, but, but in smart contract terms, that means incentivize the performance of contracts. And so if you... Okay. So that's where the ideas of smart contracts and blockchains and cryptocurrency came out of that kind of, of uh, brainstorming and dreaming and thinking. And so if you take computer science, if you take uh, Byzantine consensus is what we were working with in the 90s, um, Satoshi Nakamoto came up with Nakamoto consensus using proof of work, which is a, a big improvement on that. You apply that computer science, now all of a sudden the security that in the paper world and in the centralized digital world, which is a kind of naive transposition to the digital world of what was on paper, it involves a lot of accountants, lawyers, um, uh, government officials, police investigators, and so forth. And so it's very local. Um, it's based on politics. And we, we can cut the Gordian knot of that and replace that um, for very simple purposes, such as uh, money and, and smart contracts, which I'll talk about um, with blockchains. 
And so now I'm going to pop up, now that we've got, talked about the secure foundations, I'm going to pop up and talk about the rules and incentives to follow those rules that can be built on top of that. Now, and I'll, I'll give a comparison of, of uh, wet code versus dry code um, later in the talk, but right now, what, what a basic methodology that has inspired me that a lot of what I'm going to show you is based on is reverse engineering design patterns from traditional law, from wet code to dry code, from the legal, legal rules in the traditional legal system to software. And so these are battle-tested rules that evolved over many hundreds of years and countless numbers of disputes. Um, and there's a book called A Pattern Language that was very famous about architectural patterns. And so you can also think of legal patterns. People have tried to come up with software patterns. Those have not proved to be so persistent. They're not as highly evolved yet. And so in this reverse engineering, I'm going to talk about what you would learn in the first year of law school and what we were pursuing in the 90s and, and trying to uh, make the security and, um, independent of, of government, which in the traditional system, of course, they're not. Um, so property is the oldest form of uh, law. In fact, if you look at the evolution of governments and stuff, they came out of property law. Um, contracts are the most useful for commerce and a big part of um, the Industrial Revolution and subsequent um, economic development um, that has brought the world out of poverty. Um, and related to contracts, secured transactions, things with collateral hypothecation and so forth. And uh, of course, corporate law and related to that, constitutional law. Um, and so smart contracts draws their inspiration from traditional contracts. This is a really good, um, back in the early, in the late Middle Ages when Europe was just starting to write down contracts, they're very simple, um, to the point, you can follow them, and they make great, um, they, they give you the core, the essence of, of what they're trying to accomplish in a page or two, and they're really great for uh, learning what the essence of a contract is, and then using that to reverse engineer into a smart contract. And since it's a, the foundation of our society sitting right on top of security, and it's something you can do, it's, it's an area where you write your own laws, or you and the person you're negotiating with write your own laws, um, and in the case of smart contracts, write your own smart contract rules. And so why do we do that? Well, when we're building things, providing services, it requires combining diverse people and objects into value-producing combinations, and that means doing deals. So Alice and Bob both want a deal that will make them both better off, even though they may be strategically combative with each other, they may not trust each other very far. And again, trust minimization is a real theme that goes, goes throughout these things. Um, doing deals requires laying down rules that participants are motivated to follow. And so, as, as a comparison between wet code and dry code here, and, and kind of give you a flavor of what smart contracts are trying to accomplish, imagine the reverse. Let's take a vending machine, which I would call the great grandmother of all smart contracts, and let's try to, try to do that in traditional law. So if you got a lawyer to write out what, what a vending machine does, um, if the party of the first puts in two five-cent coins, a four said party gets a soda. If party puts in a 10, cent coin, party gets a soda. If they put in a 25 cent coin, they get back a soda, a 5 cent coin, and a 10 cent coin. And so you can see this would be very tedious for the lawyer to write down. It would be subject to all sorts of hassle and, and legal dispute. And so it's much simpler to program this behavior into a machine, and that's in fact what we've done with vending machines. And so smart contracts takes modern computer science and the much, much greater computational capabilities we have now, and does that for a much wider, broad stretch of things, and especially low-hanging fruit financial contracts, which I will talk about. So smart contracts are a security protocol that change control over things, conditional on states of the world, and on performance of obligations. And so states of the world and performance of obligations, you can think of these in the, in the lingo as two kinds of oracles. There are data that come from outside, typically the, uh, the blockchain, and um, 
So a state of the world, an example of that would be you have a smart contract based on a bet, the outcome of a, of a sports game. That would be a state of the world that you would get. Um, and performance of obligation, somebody delivering a package somewhere, and then the, the time and then location of that delivery um, is m registered by a device and, and uploaded as a blockchain, as an oracle. Um, so, and basically what I, when I say protocol, I mean algorithms, computer programs, plus the messages that they send back and forth um, is what constitutes a protocol. So smart contracts reduce mental transaction costs. Um, contracts for difference allow um, a vast amount of price information that would be really impossible to calculate in your head, and the computer does it for you, and that, that allows you to simulate uh, another, another financial instrument. Um, algorithmic management, I'm not going to talk about. That's a big area related to employment. And also more predictable is similar. So you have code. It, it's much more deterministic than a legal contract. And so it can be a lot simpler, a lot easier to predict uh, what's going to go on. And there are costs of trust and security, especially if you're operating on a global scale across jurisdictions. Um, the burden of lawsuit quickly becomes prohibitive, um, which makes it doing contracts across national borders kind of almost pointless for uh, small, small deals. And thus, as a result, it doesn't happen much. And most of cross-border business is the domain of big corporations that uh, can afford lots of lawyers and do a lot of repetitive transactions. And there's also ambiguity in legal contracts that gives rise to injustice. So, and smart contracts are often equated with D apps and run on the blockchain. And indeed, that, that code running on the blockchain, that trust-minimized code, is the core, um, the most important part of a smart contract. But we should think of it a little more broadly. Um, the Bitcoin or Ethereum contract, that trust-minimized code, controls assets, and that gives you the incentives to uh, perform based on the control of assets being conditional on what you perform. But it also involves user interfaces. User interfaces allow, allow you to search for, for potential business partners, um, allow you to negotiate with them, and then mo help monitor performance and, and let the trust-minimized code know how the performance of the contract is going. And so performance is just you know, doing what you promise to do, basically. And so again, performance verification and condition satisfaction are the two different kinds of uh, oracles that can feed into that. And so the, uh, to take a broad view of this and to see some of the economic potential here, let's look at the phases of deal making. So internet commerce over the last 30 or so years has really innovated strongly um, and revolutionized the phases of deal making, especially search and negotiation. And as we'll see, smart contracts are more focused on the performance phase, which has really lagged so far, because centralized uh, commerce can't do trust minimization. It's actually very for, for poor at doing it, trying to do a globally seamless performance phase in a, con in a deal. So anyway, um, search. Um, Uber app that matches drivers and riders is a, a good example of search. eBay, where you go on eBay and it matches buyers and sellers, that's an example of search. Um, even in the traditional brick and mortars world, a shopping mall um, is the place you could go where shoppers could be matched with the, the sellers who sell various things. And so the next phase, negotiation. Um, Uber app has a price algorithm that does the negotiation for you. And, gives you a kind of take it or leave it price uh, figured out by this algorithm. eBay has an auction that determines the price. Um, and shopping malls and traditional retail had fixed prices. So again, those are three different ways. There's a lot of different ways to do uh, contract negotiation. And then performance phase, an Uber app, the map tells the driver where to go. Um, so that helps greatly with the performance. Um, credit cards are used for payment. Uh, payment is a crucial part of most performance phases. Um, eBay used PayPal, and it was very heavily dependent on PayPal, which is why, first of all, why PayPal succeeded is because they're a good complementary match for what eBay was doing, and the eBay businesses 
had a really hard time signing up his credit card with credit cards, so PayPal provided a great alternative to that. But also because PayPal was so dependent on eBay, eBay eventually just bought them. But that, that greatly helped eBay to become a success. Is they were really great at the search and negotiation phase um, with the matching buyers and sellers from the auction, but they had really done poorly, as most internet um, companies have done poorly, with the uh, performance phase. And so P PayPal was the state of the art at that time. And so they made uh, Peter Thiel and the PayPal Mafia rich and gave e helped greatly with eBay success. And uh, of course, the shopping mall will take your cash and credit card. Um, per post performance, we have reputation systems like Yelp. Um, we have seizing or freezing of collateral, which is really trust minimized, and, and what I'm going to focus on here. And of course, a traditional thing, which is not at all trust minimized and works very poorly across um, national borders and often poorly within them, is uh, the lawsuit. And so, the first um, takeaway I want to leave with you, and this is a project um, that my team has been working on, um, is that smart contracts aren't just programs written by programmers running on a blockchain. That, that trust minimized code is a very important part of it, but I think the next generation of smart contracts are going to be things that non-programmers negotiate between them, just like, much like you would negotiate a, a traditional contract. Um, Alice gives an offer to Bob, Bob can accept or reject that offer. Um, if Bob has not accepted or rejected the offer yet, Alice can revoke that offer. That is, that's the uh, English common law in the United States version, and it maps pretty directly from wet code to dry code, which we've implemented that negotiation process. And in the process, you're forming the contract. You can customize it. So this is uh, what we're working on, one of the things we're working on. Um, Alice and Bob can create various kinds of, of contracts, derivatives and so forth, financial contracts, based on various tokens. Um, and they can negotiate this, you know, I want this token here as collateral, I want to use that token as collateral, um, et cetera, et cetera. So the editing, the formation, the creation of the smart contract goes hand in hand with negotiation. If you're not negotiating it, it's not really fully a contract. Um, smart contracts, examples, and patterns. So financial contracts, of course, that's the low-hanging fruit. Um, I'm not going to go over dispute mediation. That's not really trust minimized. Um, pools and assurance contracts, maybe briefly. And I'm going to skip smart property with the time I have. Um, OK, collateralized versions of loans, bonds, futures, options, swaps, and contracts for difference. That's really the low-hanging fruit of smart contracts. And this now goes by the buzzword of DeFi, decentralized and non-custodial finance. And so, interesting recent examples, Uniswap, um, where it acts as a trust minimized and automated market maker that you can buy or sell from. And in fact, most of the, most of the current work is supporting cryptocurrency trading, which is natural because that's a, a very big um, thing that can be put, and they're on chain. Th those are assets that are on chain, and it's a big market, so that's naturally where the, the uh, first uh, applications are happening. Um, we have token sets where you, you have some function of tokens, some combination of tokens, like you know, 70% Bitcoin, 25% ETH, so much like an ETF, um, or tracks a moving average, or so forth. There's all sorts of varieties of, of functions you can do there. Um, we have collateralized debt positions, where um, you can put, for example, um, 10 ETH or ETC into a, a CDP and then take out loans in, an, in another cryptocurrency. And you, because cryptocurrencies are volatile, they usually have to be uh, over collateralized and you have a risk of liquidation. If the price moves too much, you get liquidated. So that, that's one of the uh, shortcomings or weaknesses you have to work around. But even despite that, it's interesting that, um, for example, MakerDAO has 207 million locked up in CDPs. Um, DYDX allows you to trade on margin long or short. They've got some other derivatives. So, um, yeah, so it's interesting that despite the volatility of this collateral, that it, it's, 
at least being used in some kinds of applications. So instead of a trusted escrow, so this brings us to atomic swaps, which I think are a great building block for financial smart contracts. Um, so instead of a trusted escrow, roughly the high-level non-technical description is use trust-minimized code plus cryptographic proof of payment um, as your trust-minimized escrow instead of actually using a trusted third party. Um, and when the smart contract has received both, it sends both automated based on on-chain information. And another very interesting thing is it can be cross-chain because we have this cryptographic proof of payment. It can be used by either chain properly programmed um, to do this. And now, so one way to use this, this is an old language I invented pre-Satoshi um, back in the 1990s. Um, and basically, a, you have a future is defined in terms of atomic swap that's going to happen in the future between uh, two parties with two different, two different kinds of tokens, for example. And similarly, an option is a swap that's going to happen optionally if, if uh, somebody chooses to exercise it. And so again, I, I designed this language. This can be done in a wide variety of languages. Um, I would encourage people to, to uh, create and use these high-level languages instead of writing this long solidity, because it's going to be a lot easier to debug this high level, these high-level descriptions than to uh, find bugs and long long uh, solidity or C or Go or all these standard programming languages are not really suitable for smart contracts. And so I would strongly urge people to go to these higher levels since we're going to be doing mostly financial contracts anyway. I would encourage people to, to create and use these higher level languages. OK, so now I'm going to go more depth into what we're doing. Um, we've got the idea of, right, of obligations. And an obligation is something that you're one of the parties is expected to perform, you know, often on-chain. It could be an on-chain payment, but it could be an off-chain payment um, tracked by an oracle. And every obligation corresponds to a right in the other. So I'm taking this language, again, reverse engineering it from traditional legal wet code to dry code, and it works pretty well. So we have an obligor who has the obligation. We have an obligee, the rights holder, who is expecting this to be performed. And then the way this is incentivized is it's generally through collateral in the smart contract world. So we've got states of performance. Have you performed yet? Are you starting to perform, et cetera? Um, and so at formation, um, the first state of performance is when the contract is performed, you have, or formed, agreed to. Um, you haven't performed yet. And that's when you attach the collateral. And so from that point on, you, you cannot use the collateral for other things, assuming you've banned rehypothecation, which is a good idea. And if all obligations are poor, performed, you free the collateral once all, all the obligations are performed. If obligation is not performed by a certain deadline, um, plus a grace period, you seize the collateral. And this will show in more detail. I got, we've got five basic states in our software. Um, once it's formed, contract is formed, the collateral is attached. Performing, it's still in the state of being attached. Once it's performed, the collateral is freed. Um, if there's a curable breach, meaning they haven't performed properly, but they have a chance to uh, fix it and do what, what they promised, then the collateral remains attached. But if there's an incurable final breach, at that point, the collateral is seized. And this is a very broad, very broad framework. You can apply, it comes from contract law. It can apply to just a really wide variety of contracts. Um, again, we're, we're applying it to financial contracts. That, that's the low hanging fruit. Um, the relationship between smart contracts and traditional law, there's a lot of confusion surrounding this. Um, smart contracts are not meant to be enforceable in a court of law or any such thing. They're a very different beast. They're dry code. They're, Trust minimize software, they're a security protocol. So like the repo man, it's a security protocol. It controls what I call the burden of lawsuit. In other words, who has to sue whom? Um, if there's a cross-border contract um, and one person didn't pay, Alice didn't pay Bob, well, then Bob has to sue Alice in some court. And good luck with that, because which court are you going to use, which country, and, and so forth. So um, if possession is nine-tenths of law, then smart contracts in a lot of situations may be 99% of the law, um, especially in cross-border situations. 
because they controlled the burden of lawsuit um, by controlling the assets. Um, smart contracts are also a security philosophy. We should make security protocols correspond to the actual rights and obligations that people want in their deals. And so now I'm going to compare the, the wet, the traditional versus dry code. Um, in traditional law, logic grounds on subjective minds and analogy. You know, is this case like this one or is it different? Um, is this set of facts like this one or different? Um, software grounds on Boolean logic and bits. Uh, mathematics, basically. And security is based on threat of violence, basically, in law, contempt or imprisonment. Um, ultimately, if you don't pay your fines and fees and what the order, court has ordered you to pay. Um, software is based on replication and cryptography. It's also strong, it's, it's much more strongly secure, but it's also so in a nonviolent way. Um, predictability, law is very flexible, um, so it's unpredictable and can be unjust, but uh, it can also be more just in certain cases where the straight rule wouldn't get you the right outcome. And software is rigid. Um, it's less corrupt, much less corruptible. Um, it's much more predictable, but it also, if, if there's a case where it's unjust, it's not easy to fix. Uh, maturity, highly evolved in many cases. Law, law is much more secure. We can learn a ton of lessons. That's why I want to reverse engineer law and bring wisdom from highly evolved law into smart contracts, into dry code. And software is pretty naive. It's larval and has few experiences. And don't get me started on governments, but crypto space knows nothing about governments. It's the banks and the traditional um, organizations that know about governance. So if you're investing in a coin that's based on we have a breakthrough in governance, you're probably going to lose your shirt because the, the strength of cryptocurrency, the reason Bitcoin has 70% market cap, is trust minimization, governance minimization. In other words, we minimize our dependence on that, that aspect and we put, replace wet code with dry code. It's a very incredibly valuable thing to do. It allows you to be globally seamless. I can't emphasize enough what a backwards, retrograde, Luddite step is, you know, endorsing governance and claiming you have a governance breakthrough is. But anyway, don't get me started. <laughs> um, so, law lives in jurisdictional silos. There's Korea has one set of laws, you know, China has another set of laws, the US has another set of laws, Hong Kong has laws based on British common law, China borrowed German, which was originally Roman civil law. They have actually radically different, both borrowed from Europe, but radically different legal systems. And that's a big part of the conflict. Um, in the Hong Kong-China disputes right now is that legal difference in China trying to assert more, more of their different legal system on Hong Kong. And so uh, we do have these very different legal traditions and even within the common law world or within the civil law world, you know, we have jurisdictional silos um, and trying to go across these can be very expensive and is really one of the big reasons multinational corporations dominate global trade it's just for that reason. It's very difficult for uh, small businesses to thrive there. Um, we're starting to see that break down because of we now have trust minimized money with Bitcoin, and in the future, because we're going to have smart contracts, um, we are going to be able to do more multinational small business. Um, lawsuits are very expensive, especially when you're doing them across borders. The cost of the software is very low. And so one of the... Uh, things I want to mention are cash pools. These are, you may have heard of DAOs, Distributed Autonomous Organizations. That's a science fictional kind of thing. Um, the real core meat of that is the use of cash pools in an automated trust minimized treasury and having some rules for that treasury. Um, but it has all sorts of applications that have nothing to do with organizations, such as, for example, distributing cash flows, distributing dividends, distributing bond coupon payments. And in a way, that's really more powerful, I think, than tokens themselves or tokenizations themselves. A token just represents something, but if that something is off-chain and based on trust, that doesn't get you very far. What you're really interested in in a financial instrument is usually the cash flow. And so pooling those cash flows, even if the cash flows are coming off from a traditional off-chain um, stock or bond or so forth, um, you can trust to minimize. And the interesting thing also, an interesting distinction to make, is there's systemic 
versus particular. So they're trust minimized particular, but if you're holding a collateral mostly off chain, um, you can always get your money from the pool unless that pool is drained, and that's a systemic risk for anybody, is if that pool gets drained, then everybody is out of luck. So there's all sorts of, of things in the smart contracts and in the security protocol world where you can trust minimize the particular risk. It can't discriminate against anybody or, or prevent anybody from getting their money as long as there is money in the pool, but it can't eliminate the systemic risk. That pool might run out of money. Um, okay. So that brings us here to Lightning. I'm going to talk about Lightning a little bit because Bitcoin does dominate the crypto space right now and um, has a really good scalability model of doing, making sure you've solved that security trust minimization problem in layer one, and that's your, that's your focus. You've got to get that right before you get anything else. Um, and on that, you build more efficient layer twos that, that sacrifice a little bit that trust minimization. So, and relating to smart contracts, you can do vending machines with Lightning. So the first Lightning vending machine was uh, built in 2018. It's a chicken feeder. It dispenses, you put your Lightning Bitcoin in, it dispenses uh, worms to the little chicken here. And since then, a bunch of people have, have built these things. They're not widely deployed yet, but this is, I think, going to be a really big growth industry or uh, Lightning-based vending machines. And uh, speaking of Lightning, um, I decided to give these guys free advertisement because they didn't pay me. I, know that I just think this is really cool. Um, you can use BitRefill to prepaid store of cards, um, to get prepaid store cards with Bitcoin via Lightning. Now, of course, if you're a Bitcoin hodler, there really is only one reason you would ever spend in the short term your Bitcoin, and that's to buy a juicy steak. Unfortunately, that's one of the things they support here in Korea. So. Okay, so the potential economic impact of smart contracts, as I said before, we've already seen how these contractual innovations, these innovations in various phases of deal making, really revolutionized and made internet commerce possible. And, you know, hundreds of billions of trillions of dollars of market cap are based on these breakthroughs. Um, but they primarily happen in search and negotiation. Performance phase has really lagged. Um, and that's because they're centralized, because they're trust-based. They're not seamlessly global right now. And so smart contracts have the potential, especially in the financial area, of breaking through that. Um, and also some of the post performance, in other words, seizing or freeing collateral in a trust-minimized way to incentivize performance. And so focusing on financial smart contracts here, um, the notional amount of outstanding derivatives, in other words, the underlying value of the underlying assets, was about 542 trillion, gross market value of about 2.7 trillion. So a vast amount of money involved. Um, and there are six main kinds of derivatives dominated by interest rates, um, foreign exchange and credit, and then there's also commodity and equity derivatives. And the trading and volume and interest rate derivatives six and a half trillion a year, and about one to two billion a year in transaction fees. So that's a, it's not a huge market in terms of transaction fees, but pretty, pretty substantial, and growing rapidly. And so what smart contracts make possible are globally seamless and trust minimized uh, markets. And because of the blockchain security costs, you're gonna have somewhat higher transaction fees, and there'll be certain situations where people wanna pay those fees based on the ability to be globally seamless and avoid political risks. And so that's my uh, talk. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.